learning outcomes. After starting this module, you shall be able to differentiate between important market structures like perfect competition, monopoly, monopolistic competition and oligopoly. Learn what is meant by concentration of an industry and how it is measured. Learn how various entry barriers affect the concentration of an industry and hence determine the market structure. Introduction Market structure and barriers to entry A barrier to entry is defined as something that prevents a new entrant from freely entering an established market. The term entry barrier is related to market structures in a substantive manner. For example, perfect competition is a kind of market structure that is characterized by a homogeneous product and a large number of sellers and buyers and implies free entry and exit by definition. Thus, perfect competition implies no barrier to entry. On the other hand, monopoly is a kind of market structure that by definition has a single seller of a commodity and therefore characterized by a lot of barriers that prevent any other firm from entering the industry. In this lesson, the first section will be a brief introduction of the four types of market structures in literature which will precede the section on how various types of barriers affect market structure in terms of concentration of an industry or a market. The last section will deal with each type of barrier and its impact on industry concentration which will then be followed by a summary of the lesson. Next is market structures, its various types. Before we learn how market structures are determined by the barriers to entry and how different barriers to entry induce market structures in turn, it would be a good idea to revise the basic characteristics of the market structures that we all have studied in microeconomic theory. In microeconomic theory, there are broadly four types of market structure. Perfect competition, monopoly, monopolistic competition and oligopoly. Out of these four types, perfect competition and monopoly are considered to be the two extremes, while monopolistic competition and oligopolies come somewhere in between the two extremes. The following sections and subsections will discuss the basic and important features of these four types of market structures and will also make a comparative analysis. Perfect competition and monopoly, the two extremes. Perfect competition. Perfect competition, as the name suggests, is the type of market structure which is characterized by a very large number of both buyers and sellers who are engaged in selling an absolutely homogeneous product and have got an identical cost structure. The number of sellers is so large that none of them has a control over the price of the product which is determined by the forces of demand and supply in the market. Thus, each seller takes price as given and then decides how much output to produce and sell in the market. Further, under perfect competition, the entry as well as exit of firms is absolutely free. That is, there is no restriction of any kind on the firms to enter or exit the market. Thus, perfect competition is a market structure where there are zero barriers of entry of any kind. However, since perfect competition requires a very large number of firms selling a homogeneous product, there is no product in the world that is characterized by such a type of market structure. However, it can act as a benchmark for real world situation which can try to converge to it. Next is monopoly. Monopoly is another extreme of market structures which is characterized by the existence of sole producer and seller of a commodity in its market. And so, by virtue of that is also the maker of price in the market. Since under monopoly, there is only firm in the industry, it may charge any price depending upon its discretion. So, there is no supply function or curve in this market. Thus, under monopoly, there are infinite barriers to entry so that no other firm can enter the market and it remains a monopoly. Such markets may either be natural, that is, by virtue of a product or created by certain strategic decisions of the monopolist. 
For example, electricity generation in small countries like New Zealand is a natural monopoly. Another example of natural monopoly is Indian Railways that has been owned, managed and controlled by Indian government since beginning. Next is monopolistic competition and oligopoly more realistic structures. While perfect competition and monopoly are the two extremes of the market structures, monopolistic competition and oligopoly are midway between them. We discuss the features of the two market structures in the subsequent subsections. Monopolistic competition. Monopolistic competition is the kind of market structure where there are many buyers who are all selling the same product, but the product is not homogeneous or identical. Indeed, this is the most important characteristic of monopolistic competition that here a large number of producers are competing to sell products that are differentiated either in terms of brand names or ingredients or quality in a common market. We can find many examples of this around us. For example, consider the market for toothpaste or soaps in India. In the toothpaste market, a lot of buyers sell their products like Babool, Colgate, Neem, Mespak, Dantakranti, etc. Another example could be the market for airlines where these days a lot of discount airlines have entered the industry and competing with each other to garner maximum market share. In this type of market structure, competition is fierce and firms have to continuously keep updating and upgrading their product to maintain and increase their customer base. This type of market structure is characterized by free entry and exist of firms and therefore has low barriers to entry. Next is oligopoly. Finally, oligopoly is the kind of market structure where a few firms, two or more but not many, are competing in a market for a common product that may or may not be homogeneous. A distinctive characteristic of an oligopolistic market is that a very small number of firms account for a very large share of the entire market. Most of the markets in reality should in fact be better called as oligopolies. For example, market for luxury cars where a few players dominate most of the market share like Toyota, BMW and Mercedes Benz. In an oligopolistic market, since number of players is small, therefore an action taken by even one player in the market has not only an influence on its own profits but also on the profits of other players. Hence, the players in the market make their decisions strategically keeping in mind the potential actions taken by other players. For instance, recently when the market leader in car industry Audi announced the launch of 10 new cars in India, its challengers like Mercedes-Benz and BMW also announced the launch of 50 new models in the market. Thus, after Audi launches its new cars, its profit will not only depend upon how better that model is from customer's point of view over its older model, but also on how better these models are as compared to the models introduced by its challengers Mercedes-Benz and BMW. This is the kind of structure where firms compete intensively to capture maximum share in the market and hence this market is characterized by a lot of barriers to entry. Next is market structures and their barriers to entry. As discussed in the previous section, the degree of barriers to entry increases as one moves from perfect competition to monopolistic competition to oligopoly to monopoly as shown in figure 1. Below and concentration of firms in the industry also increases. Concentration refers to the number and size distribution of firms in a particular industry or market. If in an industry too few firms serve a large chunk of proportion of total demand for the product of that industry, we say that the industry is highly concentrated. On the other hand, if an industry has a very large number of firms, each capturing a small share of the market, then we say that the industry is not concentrated. So clearly, it implies that perfect competition is an industry which has zero concentration, while monopoly has highest concentration. On the other hand, oligopoly has a very high market concentration. Thus, 
concentration is very important feature of a market structure. Indeed, the factors that determine industry concentration will also determine market structure. Thus, it becomes important to study the concept of concentration and its determinants which in turn determine market structure. Amongst many determinants of concentration, we will focus on various barriers to entry as the determinants of concentration. This is the focus of a subsequent subsections. Next is barriers to entry as determinants of market structures. Concentration of an industry is an indicator of the number and size of firms in a market structure and hence it is an important way of differentiating between market structures. There are many ways to define industry concentration. Box 1 clearly sketches the various measures of concentration as they have evolved in the literature. First, concentration curve. Concentration curve is simply a plot of the cumulative market share of sales output that are attributable to largest through smallest firms in the industry. To make it clear, consider two industries A and B having 10 and 7 firms respectively and assume that market shares, firms output or industries output of the firms are as given below. As you can see in table 1, firm output and market shares for two hypothetical industries. Figure 2 below shows concentration curves for the two industries A and B. It is clear from the figure that concentration curve of industry B when superimposed on that of industry A lies above it as expected. Figure 2A shows concentration curve of industry A. Figure 2B demonstrates concentration curve of industry B. Although concentration curve is a good indicator of concentration in an industry, a more useful and more commonly used measure of concentration is the K firm concentration ratio CK explained below. Second, K firm concentration ratio. Concentration ratio is defined as the share of output produced and sold by the most dominant firms in a particular market or industry. If we arrange firms in the descending of their market shares as in table 1 above, then the K firm concentration ratio is defined as the sum of the largest K firms denoted by CK is equal to the summation of ranging from I to K SI, where SI is the market share of the ith firm in the market. CK will clearly vary between 0 minimum concentration and 1 maximum concentration. For instance, for industry A above, 4 firm concentration ratio will be C4 is equal to 10 into 4 which is 40%. On the other hand, for industry B, it is 70%. Although CK is quite simple to calculate and understand, it does not always give consistent rankings of industry concentration. Thus, in order to overcome this limitation, economists have come up with another measure of concentration called Herfindhel Hertzmann Index, which is used more frequently these days, especially in the US industry. Third, Herfindhel Hertzmann Index. It is measured as follows. HH1 is equal to summation i ranges to n SI square, where n is the total number of firms in the market or industry, and SI as before is the market share of firm after the firms have been ordered according to their market share from largest through smallest. HH1 for a monopoly will be 10,000. Thus for industry A above HH1 is equal to 10 square into 10 which is equal to 1000 and for industry B it equals 30 square plus 20 square plus 10 square till 10 square which is equal to 1800. Thus all the three measures give us consistent results that industry B is more concentrated than industry A. Having discussed the concept of concentration at length, the next question that arises is what determines this concentration? What are the factors behind one industry having more firms while another having less number of firms? Economists have tried to find out various factors determining concentration and therefore market structure. The oldest and the simplest of all could be Gibret's law. Gibret 1999 assumed in his analysis an industry that started with a fixed number of equal sized firms. 
with time however it was seen that some of these firms started growing at a fast pace while others lagged behind as a result the slower firms left the market and the shares of faster growing firms increased and they become dominant thus with time industry became more concentrated but all this happened due to sheer luck of these firms however empirical analysis have shown that concentration does not always rise with time and may sometimes even fall thus making luck an insufficient explanation for changes in industry concentration as a result economists thought of more logical reasons behind changes in concentration of industries amongst all these reasons these chapters will focus on entry barriers the remainder of this lesson is devoted to how various kinds of entry barriers affect industry concentration and therefore market structure next concentration and natural barriers to entry barriers to entry are the very basic determinants of market structures for instance since entry and exit is costless under perfect competition so this structure has lowest concentration while under monopoly entry is completely restricted which entails the existence of a single firm in the market as we know one important classification of barriers to entry is between natural barriers and strategic barriers natural barriers to entry are those that arise due to the basic demand and cost conditions of a market the simplest way to think about natural barriers is to think of natural monopoly natural monopoly arises when the average cost of production continuously declines as more and more output is produced thus necessitating the presence of a single firm in the market in case there are many firms and average cost is declining the firms can merge and converge to a single firm next concentration and strategic barriers to entry strategic barriers to entry are those barriers that are artificially created by the actions of incumbents in order to prevent the entry of newcomers into a market in such cases the incumbent firm may use particular pricing strategies or even capacity expansion to pose threats to the potential entrants and therefore deter their entry this could be understood by considering a simple two stage game in which first a potential entrant called challenger decides whether to enter the market or stay out and in the second stage the incumbent who has a monopoly in the market decides whether to accommodate the entrant or fight with it if it decides to fight with the entrant then it will lower its price called predatory pricing and therefore prevent customers from purchasing from the entrant while if it decides to accommodate it then it may form a cartel with the entrant and may let it enter the above situation can be represented in the form of a game tree as follows figure 3a shows two stage entry deterrence game thus in this case given that the challenger enters it is optimal for the monopolist to accommodate and given that monopolist is going to accommodate it is best for the challenger to enter thus in this example even if the monopolist announces before entry that he is going to fight with the challenger it does not affect challenger's decision this happens because the threat imposed by the monopolist is not credible enough the monopolist can make his threat credible and deter challenger's entry by announcing a strategic barrier to entry like investment in advertising or research and development this kind of an investment is made by the monopolist before the challenger enters and hence raises the sunk cost of doing business for both of them thus if the challenger wishes to enter the market he needs to incur at least that much cost to illustrate suppose in the above game theoretic example before challenger decides to enter the monopolist decides whether to invest in research and development or not and let f be the cost of doing so after the monopolist decides rest of the game remains the same except that the cost of entry is now f since this is an entry cost so it raises the sunk cost for both the challenger as well as the incumbent the game tree below describes the situation figure 3b shows three stage entry deterrence scheme with investment in sbe
Note that in this game as depicted in game 3 in figure 3b, first payoff in each cell belongs to the monopolist M, while the second one belongs to the challenger C, unlike the situation in figure 3a above. In the above game, it is clear that after the monopolist decides to invest, it is optimal for the challenger not to enter as long as F is greater than 1, but he would always enter if the monopolist does not invest in the strategic barrier to entry, SBE. Given the optimal strategy of challenger, it is optimal for the monopolist to invest as long as 5 minus F is greater than 2, that is, if F is less than 2, thus, for F greater than 1, less than 2, the SPNE of the above game is that monopolist invest in the SBE and accommodates the challenger if he enters and challenger stays out if monopolist invest and enters if monopolist does not invest. Thus, the monopolist succeeds in deterring entry for F is greater than 1, less than 2 and the concentration remains high. Next is concentration and legal barrier, I repeat, and legal barriers to entry. Another determinant of concentration of an industry could be certain legal barriers imposed by government like license fee, patents, etc. According to Sutton, 1991-1999, these types of costs are sunk cost that have to be incurred by a firm at the time of entry and may play an important role in determining the industry concentration. Sutton explains this by using the following two stage case. First, in stage one, the firms incur the sunk cost and decide whether to enter the industry or not. Second, in stage second, the firms compete in output or price once they have entered. According to Sutton, the sunk cost may be endogenous as well as exogenous, but they produce quite different results. The current section deals with the case of exogenous cost. Let the sunk cost that firms are supposed to incur in stage first be F is greater than 0 and QI be the output that firm I produces in stage second, C be the marginal cost of production, assuming that all firms are symmetric and so have same cost structure and P the price of commodity. Given that firm first enters the market in stage first, it will earn a profit which is represented by pi i is equal to p minus c into q i. Using backward induction to find out the sub game, perfect equilibrium sp any of the game, it would be optimal for firm first to enter in stage first if the profit that it earns in stage second is higher than the entry cost and so the entry of firms will continue until p minus c into q i is equal to f equation 1. Note that P minus C upon P is the profit cost margin of the firm, denoted by PCM. Also denote the total revenue of firm PQI by TR. And note that when all firms are symmetric and there are n number of firms in the industry in stage second, the herfindel hertzmann index HH1 will be equal to 1 upon n. Multiplying and dividing equation 1 by NP and collecting above information, we obtain P minus C upon P, MPQI is equal to FN. Second, that is HH1 is equal to F upon PCM into TR. Third, thus the equilibrium of the above came in equation 3 tells us that as sum cost measured by F increase or size of the industry TR decreases, or if increase in competition decreases profit of firm, concentration measured by HH1 goes up. Although presence of exogenous sunk cost affect concentration in an important way. However, as shown by Sutton 1991-1999, this conclusion may not hold in markets characterized by differentiated products and where firms spend a lot of money on advertising and research and development expenditures. Thus. He showed that in case of endogenous sunk cost like advertising expenditures on research and development expenditures, conclusions may be very different. In particular, Sutton gave a very important and different result which is that as opposed to the case with exogenous sunk cost, an increase in size of the market will reduce concentration only up to a certain point beyond which 
concentration will remain constant. This happens because in markets with differentiated products, when size of the market increases, it raises industry profits, which induces entry and therefore leads to a fall in concentration. But at the same time, increase in the size of the market induces firms to invest more in research and development to improve the quality of their products. That raises the sunk cost, which reduces entry and causes concentration to increase. Thus, this latter effect prevents concentration to fall below a certain level as the size of the market goes up. Thus, these important conclusions of Saturn's limit theorem can be shown geometrically as follows. Figure 4a and b. Here, figure 4a corresponds to the case of exogenous sunk cost when concentration converges to zero as market size increases, while figure 4b corresponds to the endogenous sunk cost when concentration converges to a number above zero. Next is antitrust laws. Antitrust laws are basically the legislations that are formed in order to prevent any kinds of monopolistic or colluding practices adopted by certain business houses. These legislations thus help in keeping the market structure more competitive instead of being monopolistic and therefore contribute to the making of a market structure. For instance, the Federal Trade Commission Act 1914 in the US set up a commission of five members appointed by the president and empowered these members to prevent persons, partnerships or corporations from using unfair methods of competition in commerce. Next is regulation and deregulation. The enforcement of the deregulation policies of the government again determine the market structure of a particular commodity. For example, when the airlines industry of the US was deregulated in 1978 by the then president, it led to entry of new discount airlines in the airline industry and increased competition for the existing airlines like American, Delta, etc. And in turn, led to fall in the prices of air tickets. Now, let us summarize. Market structure may be defined as the number and distribution of firms in a market for a commodity. There are mainly four types of market structures, with perfect competition, monopoly, monopolistic competition, and oligopoly. While monopoly, oligopoly, and monopolistic competition are found in reality, perfect competition is used as useful reference or benchmark. Industry concentration is a very important indicator of market structure and various measures are used to measure it like concentration curve, concentration ratio and Herfindahl-Hertzmann index. All types of barriers with natural, strategic and legal contribute in different ways to the industry concentration and hence determine the market structure. While in the presence of exogenous sunk cost like license fees, an increase in market size leads to a continuous fall in concentration. In the presence of endogenous sunk cost like advertising expenditure, concentration falls only up to a certain point on the other hand. Thank you.